Chapter 2 At the count of seventy, Spike was back, popping up at my window like noisy toast. Finished already? I chirped. He opened his mouth and closed it, but didn't speak. Must have been grueling, I pressed. I mean, if you'll pardon my comment, you look so tired. Did you have any... Stop! He exploded. Please! He remained at the window and lowered his head. All right, I apologize, Sam. My behavior was really disgusting. In fact, I'm a worm. I was thinking pig, I announced, as in greedy. I was thinking worm, he appealed, as in low. I considered the option. A piggy wormlet's a reasonable compromise. What do you say? He pawed at his whiskers. Well, now I don't know. I was kind of leaning towards wormy piglet. Wormy piglet, I said, is okay. He leapt to the blotter. I truly apologize, Sam. I just... I don't know what happened. I looked at those eyes and got carried away. But not quite as far as the Beaumont Gallery. He looked at the carpet and mumbled, No. Was there any reason, I said, without mercy? A trained detective. Come on, let up. I didn't get to the Beaumont Gallery. Because... I didn't know where it was. It's on Fourth and Chameleon, I offered. Sam, how did you know that? He narrowed his eyes. I'm a trained detective. I flicked my tail at the open phone book. I looked it up. If you work in Manhattan, and if you're a cat... The easiest place you could manage to work would be Greenwich Village, a patch of turf that's south of 14th Street and north of Houston. Pronounced as Houston, but never mind. What you get in the village is relative quiet and minimal traffic, and cobblestone streets and three-story houses and street-level shops, and meandering alleys, and gated parks with the kind of gates you can slip right under, or jump right over, and poof, you're gone. The dislikable thing you get in the village is total confusion. Irrational routes. Triangular streets that appear out of nowhere and bend like a hairpin and end in a knot. So, for instance, 12th Street traverses 4th Street, and sends you in circles at Abingdon Square. It wasn't exactly a night to get lost. It had stopped snowing and nothing had stuck, but the streets were deserted and glistening wet, and a boisterous wind coming straight from the river was drumming up tunes on the garbage can lids. We'd gotten to 4th Street and stopped for a light, it was one of those corners that wasn't a corner, but more like the meaningless point of a V, and it offered a starburst of possible streets. I spotted a penny and said, Want to flip? Spike shook his head at me, shivering deeply and trying to bury himself in his coat. Angle right and then cut through the garden. I looked at him briefly and said, Are you sure? I'm freezing to death, he announced. Am I sure? I nodded agreement and followed his lead. We walked in silence. I dated a girl once at Seven Chameleon, he said. Bernadette. She worked at a shop called the Fatal Fedora. I beg your pardon? The Fatal Fedora? It's one of those shops that sells poisonous hats. I said, Spike, will you stop it? He started to laugh, and his laughter sat there like smoke in the air. 
What they sell there is magic, he offered. Tricks. Invisible inkwells and some of those cute little wiggly spiders you pull out of... Right. So what did she do there? She sat in the window and flirted with tourists, is what she did. You know. She'd see one and leap at the window and do little mewings and angle her head. She could rope in the suckers like nobody's business. You're sounding bitter. So maybe I am. She ran off with a mouser, he said. A sneaky, no-good Persian with muscles for brains. But you learned your lesson. Oh, yeah. Of course. He looked at me sideways. So what did I learn? Not to act like a sucker, I said. And not to go out on a limb for a flirt with a face. You're referring to Bridget, he said. You guessed. We were crossing the garden, a brave little plot that was taking the winter with vegetable spunk. The grass was spiky, but hanging in, at its further edges, the frozen lamplight floated like vapors of yellowish fog and surrounded a sign that said, Fourth and Chameleon. I hit the sidewalk and glanced at the street. The fatal fedora was shut for the night, but its neon intelligence winked at the world. Tricks can be treats, it instructed in yellow, and burbled in purple. It's fun to be fooled. It was number seven. We wanted twelve, so we kept on trucking. The street was dark, with no other shop lights and no other lamps. If the buildings were houses, then no one was home. I noted a panel truck parked at the curb with a hand-lettered sign that said, Beaumont Gallery slash 19th Century Art and Antiques. It was parked at eleven. We trotted to twelve, where a darkened window, a giant bay, showed a couple of paintings, a grandfather clock, and, beyond its horizon, a darkened room. So we must have just missed them. Spike looked relieved. The grandfather clock said 11-11. I looked for an entrance. A bit to the side was a trio of steps that led down from the sidewalk and killed a few feet till it got to a door. I went up to the steps and looked down at the door. There was nothing special about that door. It was just a door like a million other doors with wooden panels and one of those knockers that looks like a lion who's eating a bagel. I'd like to go home now. Spike sounded firm. Let's get out of here, Sammy. It's locked for the night. I nodded agreement and still didn't move. There was something eerie that came from the building. The kind of silence that comes from a grave. And it fixed my attention and tickled my ears. I went down to the doorway and sniffed at its hinge. The aroma of terror came out with a force that was practically physical. Punch in the nose. It was partly human and partly cat, and whatever had frightened them reeked of cigars. I motioned to Spike. Come here for a second. I need to borrow the tip of your... Nose was the end of that sentence, but just as I thought of it, the wind cut me off with a hideous shriek like a chorus of witches who wanted their supper and wanted it now. It banged at the knocker and rattled the door. I turned at the rattle and jumped at the pop. The sound of a bolt blowing out of its cradle and hurled myself forward, bombarding the door with the flying propulsion of all fours. I must have been lucky. It suddenly gave like a grandma at Christmas. The thing busted inward and carried me with it and whanged at the wall. I dropped the carpet and motioned to Spike. But before he could make it, the wind double-crossed me and doubled behind me and suddenly... Slam!